This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Lord Jim by Joseph Conrad, chapters 41 and 42. Chapter 41 to the very last moment, till the full day came upon them with a spring, the fires on the west bank blazed bright and clear, and then Brown saw in a knot of coloured figures motionless between the advanced houses a man in European clothes, in a helmet, all white. "'That's him! Look! Look!' Cornelius said excitedly. All Brown's men had sprung up and crowded at his back with lustreless eyes. The group of vivid colours and dark faces with the white figure in their midst were observing the knoll. Brown could see naked arms being raised to shade the eyes, and other brown arms pointing. What should he do? He looked around, and the forest that faced him on all sides walled the cockpit of an unequal contest. He looked once more at his men a contempt, a weariness, the desire of life, the wish to try for one more chance, for some other grave, struggled in his breast. From the outline the figure presented, it seemed to him that the white man there, backed up by all the power of the land, was examining his position through binoculars. Brown jumped up on the log, throwing his arms up, the palms outward, the coloured group closed round the white man, and fell back twice before he got clear of them, walking slowly alone. Brown remained standing on the log till Jim, appearing and disappearing between the patches of thorny scrub, had nearly reached the creek. Then Brown jumped off and went down to meet him on his side. They met, I should think, not very far from the place, perhaps on the very spot, where Jim took the second desperate leap of his life, the leap that landed him into the life of Patizan, into the trust, the love, the confidence of the people. They faced each other across the creek, and with steady eyes tried to understand each other before they opened their lips. Their antagonism must have been expressed in their glances, I know that Brown hated Jim at first sight. Whatever hopes he might have had had vanished at once. This was not the man he had expected to see. He hated him for this, and in a checked flannel shirt with sleeves cut off at the elbows, grey-bearded, with a sunken, sun-blackened face, he cursed in his heart the other's youth and assurance, his clear eyes and his untroubled bearing. That fellow had got in a long way before him. He did not look like a man who would be willing to give anything for assistance. He had all the advantages on his side. Possession, security, power. He was on the side of an overwhelming force. He was not hungry and desperate, and he did not seem in the least afraid. And there was something in the very neatness of Jim's clothes, from the white helmet to the canvas leggings and the pipe-clayed shoes, which in Brown's sombre, irritated eyes seemed to belong to things he had in the very shaping of his life condemned and flouted. "'Who are you?' asked Jim at last, speaking in his usual voice. "'My name's Brown,' answered the other loudly. "'Captain Brown! What's yours?' And Jim, after a little pause, went on quietly, as if he had not heard. "'What made you come here?' "'You want to know?' said Brown bitterly. "'It's easy to tell. Hunger! And what made you?' "'The fellow started at this,' said Brown, relating to me the opening of this strange conversation between those two men, separated only by the muddy bed of a creek, but standing on the opposite poles of that conception of life which includes all mankind. "'The fellow started at this, and got very red in the face. Too big to be questioned, I suppose. I told him that if he looked upon me as a dead man with whom you may take liberties, he himself was not a whit better off, really. I had a fellow up there who had a bead drawn on him all the time, and only waited for a sign from me. There was nothing to be shocked at at this.' He had come down of his own free will. 
Let us agree, said I, that we are both dead men, and let us talk on that basis as equals. We are all equals before death, I said. I admitted I was there like a rat in a trap, but we had been driven to it, and even a trapped rat can give a bite. He caught me up in a moment. Not if you don't go near the trap till the rat is dead. I told him that sort of game was good enough for these native friends of his, but I would have thought him too white to serve even a rat so. Yes, I had wanted to talk with him, not to beg for my life, though. My fellows were, well, what they were, men like himself, anyhow. All we wanted from him was to come on in the devil's name and have it out. God damn it, said I, while he stood there as still as a wooden post. You don't want to come out here every day with your glasses to count how many of us are left on our feet. Come, either bring your infernal crowd along, or let us go out and starve in the open sea, by God. You have been white once, for all your talk of this being your own people and you being one with them. Are you? And what the devil do you get for it? "'What is it you've found here that's so damn precious, hey? "'You don't want us to come down here, perhaps, do you? "'You are two hundred to one. "'You don't want us to come down into the open. "'Ah, I promise you we shall give you some sport before you've done. "'You talk about me making a cowardly set upon an unoffending people. "'What's that to me that they are unoffending, "'when I am starving for next to no offence? "'But I am not a coward. Don't you be one. Bring them along, or by all the fiends we shall yet manage to send half your unoffending town to heaven with us in smoke.' He was terrible, relating this to me, this tortured skeleton of a man drawn up together with his face over his knees upon a miserable bed in that wretched hovel, and lifting his head to look at me with malignant triumph. "'That's what I told him. I knew what to say,' he began again, feebly at first, but working himself up with incredible speed into a fiery utterance of his scorn. "'We aren't going into the forest to wander like a string of living skeletons, dropping one after another for ants to go to work upon us before we are fairly dead. Oh, no. You don't deserve a better fate,' he said." "'And what do you deserve?' I shouted at him. "'You that I find skulking here with your mouth full of your responsibility, "'of innocent lives, of your infernal duty. "'What do you know more of me than I know of you? "'I came here for food, do you hear? "'Food to fill our bellies. "'And what did you come for? "'What did you ask for when you came here? "'We don't ask you for anything but to give us a fight.' or a clear road to go back whence we came. I would fight with you now, says he, pulling in his little moustache, and I would let you shoot me and welcome, I said. This is as good a jumping-off place for me as another. I am sick of my infernal luck. But it would be too easy. There are my men in the same boat, and by God I am not the sort to jump out of trouble and leave them in a damned lurch, I said. He stood thinking for a while, and then wanted to know what I had done. Out there, he says, tossing his head downstream, to be hazed about so. Have we met to tell each other the story of our lives, I asked him. Suppose you begin. No? Well, I'm sure I don't want to hear. Keep it to yourself. I know it is no better than mine. I've lived and so did you, though you talk as if you were one of those people that should have wings so as to go about without touching the dirty earth. Well, it is dirty. I haven't got any wings. I am here because I was afraid once in my life. Want to know of what? Of a prison. That scares me, and you may know it. If it's any good to you, I won't ask you what scared you into this infernal hole, where you seem to have found pretty pickings. That's your luck, and this is mine. The privilege to beg for the favor of being shot quickly, or else kicked out to go free and starve in my own way. 
His debilitated body shook with an exultation so vehement, so assured, and so malicious, that it seemed to have driven off the death waiting for him in that hut. The corpse of his mad self-love uprose from rags and destitution as from the dark horrors of a tomb. It is impossible to say how much he lied to Jim then, how much he lied to me now, and to himself always. Vanity plays lurid tricks with our memory, and the truth of every passion wants some pretense to make it live. Standing at the gate of the other world in the guise of a beggar, he had slapped this world's face, he had spat on it, he had thrown upon it an immensity of scorn and revolt at the bottom of his misdeeds. He had overcome them all, men, women, savages, traders, ruffians, missionaries, and Jim, that beefy-faced beggar. I did not begrudge him this triumph in articulo mortis, this almost posthumous illusion of having trampled all the earth under his feet, while he was boasting to me in his sordid and repulsive agony, I couldn't help thinking of the chuckling talk relating to the time of his greatest splendor, when, during a year or more, Gentleman Brown's ship was to be seen, for many days on end, hovering off an islet befringed with green upon azure, with the dark dot of the mission-house on a white beach, while Gentleman Brown, ashore, was casting his spells over a romantic girl for whom Melanesia had been too much, and giving hopes of a remarkable conversion to her husband. The poor man, some time or other, had been heard to express the intention of winning Captain Brown to a better way of life. Bag Gentleman Brown for glory, as a leery-eyed loafer expressed it once, just to let them see up above what a Western Pacific trading skipper looks like. And this was the man, too, who had run off with a dying woman, and had shed tears over her body. Carried on like a big baby, his then mate was never tired of telling. And where the fun came in, I may be kicked to death by diseased Kanakas if I know. Why, gents, she was too far gone when he brought her aboard to know him. She just lay there on her back in his bunk, staring at the beam with awful shining eyes, and then she died. Damn bad sort of fever, I guess. I remembered all these stories while, wiping his matted lump of a beard with a livid hand, he was telling me from his noisome couch how he got round, got in, got home on that confounded, immaculate, don't-you-touch-me sort of fellow. He admitted that he couldn't be scared, but there was a way, as broad as a turnpike, to get in and shake his twopenny soul around and inside out and upside down, by God! Chapter 42 I don't think he could do more than perhaps look upon that straight path. He seemed to have been puzzled by what he saw, for he interrupted himself in his narrative more than once to exclaim, He nearly slipped from me there. I could not make him out. Who was he? And after glaring at me wildly, he would go on, jubilating and sneering. To me, the conversation of these two across the creek appears now as the deadliest kind of duel on which fate looked on with her cold-eyed knowledge of the end. No, he didn't turn Jim's soul inside out, but I am much mistaken if the spirit so utterly out of his reach had not been made to taste to the full bitterness of that contest. These were the emissaries with whom the world he had renounced was pursuing him in his retreat, white men from out there, where he did not think himself good enough to live. This was all that came to him, a menace, a shock, a danger to his work. I suppose it is this sad, half-resentful, half-resigned feeling, piercing through the few words Jim said now and then, that puzzled Brown so much in the reading of his character— some great men owe most of their greatness to the ability of detecting in those they destine for their tools the exact quality of strength that matters for their work, and Brown, as though he had been really great, had a satanic gift of finding out the best and the weakest spot in his victims. He admitted to me that Jim wasn't of the sort that can be got over by truckling, and accordingly he took care to show himself 
as a man confronting without dismay ill luck censure and disaster the smuggling of a few guns was no great crime he pointed out as to coming to patizan who had the right to say he hadn't come to beg the infernal people here let loose at him from both banks without staying to ask questions he made the point brazenly for in truth dain waris's energetic action had prevented the greatest calamities because brown told me distinctly that perceiving the size of the place he had resolved instantly in his mind that as soon as he had gained a footing he would set fire right and left and begin by shooting down everything living in sight in order to cow and terrify the population the disproportion of forces was so great that this was the only way of giving him the slightest chance of attaining his ends he argued in a fit of coughing but he didn't tell jim this as to the hardships and starvation they had gone through these had been very real it was enough to look at his band he made at the sound of a shrill whistle all his men appear standing in a row on the logs in full view so that jim could see them for the killing of the man it had been done well it had but was this not war bloody war in a corner and the fellow had been killed cleanly shot through the chest not like that poor devil of his lying now in the creek. They had to listen to him dying for six hours with his entrails torn with slugs. At any rate, this was a life for a life. And all this was said with the weariness, with the recklessness of a man spurred on and on by ill luck till he cares not where he runs. When he asked Jim with a sort of brusque despairing frankness whether he himself, straight now, didn't understand that when it came to saving one's life in the dark one didn't care who else went three thirty three hundred people it was as if a demon had been whispering advice in his ear i made him wince boasted brown to me he very soon left off coming the righteous over me he just stood there with nothing to say and looking as black as thunder not at me on the ground he asked Jim whether he had nothing fishy in his life to remember that he was so damnably hard upon a man trying to get out of a deadly hole by the first means that came to hand, and so on, and so on. And there ran through the rough talk a vein of subtle reference to their common blood, an assumption of common experience, a sickening suggestion of common guilt, of secret knowledge, that was like a bond of their minds and of their hearts. At last Brown threw himself down full length and watched Jim out of the corners of his eyes. Jim, on his side of the creek, stood thinking and switching his leg. The houses in view were silent, as if a pestilence had swept them clean of every breath of life, but many invisible eyes were turned from within upon the two men with the creek between them, a stranded white boat and the body of the third man half sunk in the mud. On the river canoes were moving again, for Patizan was recovering its belief in the stability of earthly institutions since the return of the white lord. The right bank, the platforms of the houses, the rafts moored along the shores, even the roofs of bathing huts were covered with people that, far away, out of earshot and almost out of sight, were straining their eyes towards the knoll beyond the Rajah's stockade. Within the wide irregular ring of forests, broken in two places by the sheen of the river, there was a silence. "'Will you promise to leave the coast?' Jim asked. Brown lifted and let fall his hand, giving everything up, as it were, accepting the inevitable. "'And surrender your arms,' Jim went on. Brown sat up and glared across. "'Surrender our arms! Not till you come to take them out of our stiff hands! You think I am gone crazy with funk? Oh, no! That and the rags I stand in is all I've got in the world, besides a few more breech-loaders on board, and I expect to sell the lot in Madagascar, if I ever get so far, begging my way from ship to ship.' Jim said nothing to this. At last, throwing away the switch he held in his hand, he said, as if speaking to himself, "'I don't know whether I have the power.' "'You don't know!' 
and you wanted me just now to give up my arms <laughs> that's good too cried brown and suppose they say one thing to you and do the other thing to me he calmed down markedly i dare say you have the power what's the meaning of all this talk he continued what did you come down here for to pass the time of day very well said jim lifting his head suddenly after a long silence you shall have a clear road or else a clear fight he turned on his heel and walked away brown got up at once but he did not go up the hill till he had seen jim disappear between the first houses he never set his eyes on him again on his way back he met cornelius slouching down with his head between his shoulders he stopped before Brown. "'Why didn't you kill him?' he demanded in a sour, discontented voice. "'Because I could do better than that,' Brown said with an amused smile. "'Never, never,' protested Cornelius with energy. "'Couldn't. I have lived here for many years.' Brown looked up at him curiously. There were many sides to the life of that place in arms against him, things he would never find out. Cornelius slunk past dejectedly in the direction of the river. He was now leaving his new friends. He accepted the disappointing course of events with a sulky obstinacy, which seemed to draw more together his little yellow old face, and as he went down he glanced askant here and there, never giving up his fixed idea. Henceforth events move fast without a check flowing from the very hearts of men like a stream from a dark source, and we see Jim amongst them, mostly through Tommy Tom's eyes. The girl's eyes had watched him too, but her life is too much entwined with his. There is her passion, her wonder, her anger, and above all her fear and her unforgiving love. Of the faithful servant, uncomprehending as the rest of them, it is the fidelity alone that comes into play a fidelity and a belief in his lord so strong that even amazement is subdued to a sort of saddened acceptance of a mysterious failure. He has eyes only for one figure, and, through all the mazes of bewilderment, he preserves his air of guardianship, of obedience, of care. His master came back from his talk with the white men, walking slowly towards the stockade in the street. Everyone was rejoiced to see him return, for while he was away every man had been afraid not only of him being killed, but also of what would come after. Jim went into one of the houses where old Doramin had retired, and remained alone for a long time with the head of the Boogie's settlers. No doubt he discussed the only course to follow with him then, but no man was present at the conversation. Only Tom Itam, keeping as close to the door as he could, heard his master say, "'Yes, I shall let all the people know that such is my wish. But I spoke to you, O Doramin, before all the others, and alone, for you know my heart as well as I know yours, and its greatest desire. And you know well also that I have no thought but for the people's good.' Then his master, lifting the sheeting in the doorway, went out, and he, Tam Itam, had a glimpse of old Doramin within, sitting in the chair with his hands on his knees, and looking between his feet. Afterwards he followed his master to the fort, where all the principal boogies and partisan inhabitants had been summoned for a talk. Tom Itam himself hoped that there would be some fighting. "'What was it but the taking of another hill?' he exclaimed regretfully. However, in the town, many hoped that the rapacious strangers would be induced by the sight of so many brave men making ready to fight to go away. It would be a good thing if they went away. Since Jim's arrival had been made known before daylight by the gun fired from the fort, and the beating of the big drum there, the fear that had hung over Patizan had broken and subsided like a wave on a rock, leaving the seething foam of excitement, curiosity, and endless speculation. Half of the population had been ousted out of their homes for purposes of defence, and were living in the street on the left side of the river, crowding round the fort, 
and in momentary expectation of seeing their abandoned dwellings on the threatened bank burst into flames. The general anxiety was to see the matter settled quickly. Food, through Jewel's care, had been served out to the refugees. Nobody knew what their white man would do. Some remarked that it was worse than in Sharif Ali's war. Then many people did not care. Now everybody had something to lose. The movements of canoes passing to and fro between the two parts of the town were watched with interest. A couple of Bugi's war-boats lay anchored in the middle of the stream to protect the river, and a thread of smoke stood at the bow of each. The men in them were cooking their midday rice when Jim, after his interviews with Brown and Doramin, crossed the river and entered by the water-gate of his fort. The people inside crowded round him so that he could hardly make his way to the house. They had not seen him before, because on his arrival during the night he had only exchanged a few words with the girl, who had come down to the landing stage for the purpose, and had gone on at once to join the chiefs and the fighting men on the other bank. People shouted greetings after him. One old woman raised a laugh by pushing her way to the front madly and enjoining him in a scolding voice to see to it that her two sons, who were with Doramin, did not come to harm at the hands of the robbers. Several of the bystanders tried to pull her away, but she struggled and cried, "'Let me go! What is this, O Muslims? This laughter is unseemly! Are they not cruel, bloodthirsty robbers bent on killing?' "'Let her be,' said Jim." and as a silence fell suddenly he said slowly everybody shall be safe he entered the house before the great sigh and the loud murmurs of satisfaction had died out there's no doubt his mind was made up that brown should have his way clear back to the sea his fate revolted was forcing his hand he had for the first time to affirm his will in the face of outspoken opposition there was much talk, and at first my master was silent, Tammy Tam said. Darkness came, and then I lit the candles on the long table. The chiefs sat on each side, and the lady remained by my master's right hand. When he began to speak, the unaccustomed difficulty seemed only to fix his resolve more immovably. The white men were now waiting for his answer on the hill. Their chief had spoken to him in the language of his own people making clear many things difficult to explain in any other speech. They were erring men whom suffering had made blind to right and wrong. It is true that lives had been lost already, but why lose more? He declared to his hearers, the assembled heads of the people, that their welfare was his welfare, their losses his losses, their mourning his mourning. He looked round at the grave, listening faces, and told them to remember that they had fought and worked side by side. They knew his courage. Here a murmur interrupted him. And that he had never deceived them. For many years they had dwelt together. He loved the land and the people living in it with a very great love. He was ready to answer with his life for any harm that should come to them, if the white men with beards were allowed to retire. They were evil-doers, but their destiny had been evil, too. Had he ever advised them ill? Had his words ever brought suffering to the people, he asked? He believed that it would be best to let these whites and their followers go with their lives. It would be a small gift. I, whom you have tried and found always true, ask you to let them go. He turned to Doramin. The old Nakoda made no movement. Then, said Jim, call in Dain Waris, your son, my friend, for in this business I shall not lead. End of chapters 41 and 42